The Dentalpreneur Podcast. Okay, doctor, it's time to put down that handpiece. You're listening to the show dedicated to helping dentists get their lives back. It's time to decrease your stress, increase your profitability, and regain your passion. Now introducing your host, Dr. Mark Costas. Greetings, dentalpreneurs. One of the most common questions I get is, what makes you different from other dental coaches and consultants, and how is your group different from all the other dental consultancy groups out there? Well, my answer usually surprises most people, and it's simply this. I'm not the smartest guy in the world. In fact, it took me three years and 21 attempts to get a single acceptance into dental school. But in my career, I've been blessed with business success early on because I reframed the typical definition of failure. To me, failures and mistakes are part of the game. It's what you do with the information that you get from your mistake or failure that separates the mediocre from the exceptional business owner. This year marks my 13th year in the dental profession, and this year I'll be acquiring my 11th dental practice. I'm still a practicing dentist, not because I have to be, but because I want to be. I'm passionate about our profession, both clinically and in coaching other dentists to reach their full potential in business and in life. So what makes our coaching group different from the other choices out there? Well, first of all, we're small. I have no desire to be the biggest coaching group or dental consultancy in the world. We have a small stable of incredible coaches who like me are practice owners, practicing dentists, and understand what it feels like to juggle all the responsibilities of being an incredible clinician and running a successful business. Number two, we're collaborative. Simply put, all of our clients know each other and we all help each other out. We see each other regularly at mastermind meetings and communicate all the time on our private Google group. We're like a big family. And for that reason, we're quite selective about who we work with because just like any other team, each member has to contribute in a positive way. Number three, we're affordable. Most people are shocked when they realize how reasonable our program is compared to what other coaches and consultants out there are charging. Number four, we get results. On average, our clients have a 24% growth rate, a 10% reduction in overhead, and our client retention rate is 96%. Think about that. From the start of our company, the Dental Success Institute, to present day, we still have 96% of the clients that we've had from the very beginning. That's unprecedented. And it says a lot about how effective this process is and how important it is to have a like-minded group of individuals and professionals that are holding each other accountable and uh, creating great results. Now, I have to say legally that those aren't typical results and they're not guaranteed results, but what I can tell you is that if you follow our advice, our program truly works. So right now we're offering a three-month practice analysis where we'll analyze everything from your overhead to your profitability to your marketing to your new patient acquisition and identify your biggest areas of opportunity and follow it up with a complimentary coaching call. Now, there's absolutely no obligation, but if you like our style and we like you, we can talk about how to become a member of our group that we call the Elite Practice Mastermind. If you'd like to take me up on this offer, simply email me at info at true dentalsuccess.com that's info at true dentalsuccess.com simple as that so if you're ready to take your practice to the next and highest level shoot me an email today i look forward to chatting with you in today's episode i'm going to be interviewing wendy askins and wendy is a senior investigator at prosperident um, i'm sure you all have heard of prosperident david harris is the founder of Prosperident. They have a great reputation in our profession for being able to investigate and uncover embezzlement in dental offices. That's what they specialize in and that's all they do is embezzlement investigation for dental offices. Very, very specific, but they're very, very good at it. This is actually kind of a depressing topic, uh, but absolutely necessary given some of the statistics that she'll talk about and how prevalent it is in dental offices. Uh, in fact, we are in the process of working with a client 
where we were doing some analysis of their overhead and we found a large chunk of money missing. In fact, it was over $50,000 just for 2016 that we could not reconcile between the software reports that we were getting at the end of every month and the money that was hitting the bank. Long story short, very, very sad situation, but a very, very trusted employee, somebody that uh, the owners had considered family, uh, had been stealing money from them for years, several hundreds of thousands of dollars that we've uncovered so far. And, uh, you know, it was the last person in the world that, that this owner thought would do something like that to them. Very, very sad, but it's the reality of owning a small business. And if you take your eyes off the ball and if you entrust the wrong person without checks and balances in place, you too can fall victim to this type of embezzlement. So I wanted to replay this episode because it's so powerful. And if you guys have a hunch or you're not properly watching um, your accounts and you don't have any checks and balances in place and basically you're entrusting a single person, you may be very, very at risk for this sort of thing. So enjoy this episode. Again, it's Wendy Askins, and we'll talk to you all next week. Take care. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Dentalpreneur Podcast. I'm excited today to welcome Wendy Askins. Wendy is a senior investigator at Prosperident, which is the world's largest dental embezzlement investigative firm. She has over 25 years experience in the dental field and has an MBA as well as degrees in psychology and criminology. So that blend of real world dental experience and educational background makes her uniquely qualified to investigate dental office embezzlement. And it's a bigger problem than all of us might think that it is. And we're going to go over some statistics as well to, and she'll, she'll kind of explain how prevalent this problem is in dental offices. And on a personal note, I had the pleasure of meeting Wendy at our most recent event, the dental success summit in Scottsdale. And she was just a delight. Uh, she's one of our featured speakers. She's one of our most popular speakers at the event. Her style is really relaxed, but informative. And um, she's just a great speaker. I think you guys are going to love her energy. So with that said, welcome to the podcast, Wendy. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Dr. Costas. It's a joy to speak with you. Yeah, it's great. So where are we talking to you from? Where, where, you, um, where do you hail from? I am from Houston, Texas. Okay, awesome. You so, can't tell from my accent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she's just a little spitfire, guys. If you, if you ever get a chance, if she's speaking at any events, I recommend you guys coming out to see her. Um, she, her energy is just totally awesome, and um, she just lights up the whole room. Um, so you won, you won over the crowd uh, at Scottsdale, Wendy, so I'm hoping that you can uh, kind of bring the same energy to, to, the, to the podcast audience here today. How's that sound? I, I'm glad to. Okay, great, great. So can you tell us a little bit about dental embezzlement? What are some statistics that you shared with us in Scottsdale that just kind of blew me away as far as how often this actually happens to uh, general dentists out there? Yeah, um, it is incredibly prevalent. Um, unfortunately, um, the last official study that was done was in 2004 by the ADA which suggests somewhere uh, around 65%. But now that was in 2004. Um, I kind of go by from my personal files and from my clients and 75 to 80% of my clients um, have confirmed embezzlement. So uh, I would put it up way up there around 80%. So you're thinking that the ADA study in 2004 was, was a little low as far as their percentages. Yes, um, absolutely. It was low and we've had um, a shift in our economy, which is part of the reason um, why someone would embezzle, obviously. Um, and then the growth of our industry as well. A and, you know, an another issue that we have, which is why I was so thrilled that you addressed this issue at the Dental Success Summit, is that we have a lot of underreporting by doctors, which right. is um, something that I was hoping that we could address in in this podcast, and that there seems to be a negative stigma that goes along with 
doctors that have been embezzled from. And I really want to make it part of my mission to remove that stigma and start having an open and honest conversation about why people are stolen from and how they're stolen from and how the doctor really doesn't have anything to do with it. Someone's either going to steal from you or they're not going to steal from you. So we have a lot of um, underreporting as well, too. So that concerns me. Yeah. So per perhaps uh, there's just ignorance and there's underreporting because the doctors don't know what's going on. And then there's that shame factor where, oh my gosh, I feel so silly and I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit this to my colleagues or to any survey that this has actually happened to me. Maybe, maybe feeling those, those particular doctors, maybe feeling like, oh, uh, this doesn't happen to everybody. And I really kind of blew it here. Um, not, not knowing the reality of the statistics that it happens to most of us during our career. Yes, absolutely. You're right. Right. So, okay. So let's, let's kind of backtrack just a little bit. If you don't mind, Wendy, I'd love to hear the story of how you went from, um, uh, just it, working in the dental profession to becoming an investigator of dental embezzlement. It seems like kind of uh, a very small, narrow sub niche within our profession <laughs> to say the least. So I would love to hear your backstory. Okay. Okay. Well, um, about 25 years ago, I was led into dentistry, um, because I needed a job basically. Right. <laughs> um, but now that I look back, I like to call it divine province that led me into dentistry. And, and fortunately early in my career, um, I was working in an office um, which someone was embezzling from. Okay. Were you a dental assistant, front office, back office? Um, no, I was actually a practice administrator. Okay. Uh -huh. um, and I, I, can, <laughs> I, I still feel that moment. I, I, can, I can see it. I can feel the knot in my stomach when a patient pulled me aside and said, you know, I have a question about my bill. Um, and, you know, I, uh, I said, well, she said, well, I made a payment last month and it's not on here. And I said, well, you know, that's, we've had some computer issues lately and I, I'm sure, I, I'm sure that's what it is. I see that you pay your, your bill every month like clockwork and you always pay with your visa card. And she said, yeah, that's another question I have. We don't even have a credit card. Oh, interesting. And uh, I, it, it's like all of the air was sucked out of the room at once and time stood still. Because at that point, I knew exactly what was happening. And it explained a lot of questions that I had had, um, you know, ab ab about why we didn't have any profits. You know, we would talk to the doctor about, you know, doing a bonus, doing a bonus program. And he would say, well, you know, I just don't, I just don't think we have enough money to do that. Or, or let's take a, let's take a, a, a trip. Let's do a staff retreat. Well, we just don't have the money to do that. And on the other hand, the staff members are saying, are you kidding me? I mean, we work from sunup until sundown. Our practice is fully booked. We see the production that's being created. Where's the money? And right then it became clear where the money was going. It was going into the receptionist's pocket. Um, so that was my first exposure to embezzlement. So throughout my entire career, I've kind of been asking myself, if I were going to steal money, how would I do it? So as a practice administrator, I would look at the different systems that were going that were going on in the office, different procedures, different policies, and I would I would think to myself, okay, we have a hole over here, we need to plug that up. So about three years ago, a little over three years ago, I was incredibly blessed to be introduced to David Harris, and he and I joined forces. And that's how I got to where I am today. Wow. And you guys have such a sophisticated company now. It's, it's the biggest in the world at what you guys do. And you have um, a very, very 
I guess, uh, defined way to, to figure out exactly how much money is being taken or if money is being taken in the first place. So I guess that the process starts by somebody kind of suspecting something happening in their office, reaching out to you guys for, for some sort of an analysis. And then you guys work behind the scenes to not alert any of the front office people, uh, to make sure that you can, uh, kind of, um, decipher what's happening behind the scenes. Is that, is that how it works? Can you, can you explain the that's, process a little that's bit? That's exactly right. Okay. Um, it, it generally starts um, with a very, very simple question. For example, um, a, a case that I'm, I'm working on right now with confirmed embezzlement, it started because it, it was an, it's an orthodontic specialist office. And it started because one of the assistants, they were about to do a debond or they were going to remove the braces from right. a patient. And the assistant happened to look on the ledger and there was no contract. And this patient had been in treatment for over two years and there was no contract. And so she simply turned to the doctor and, and said, you know, doctor, we need to take a look at this. This patient doesn't have a contract. And wow, did it ever blow open a hornet's nest of what was happening in this gentleman's office. Um, so it, so started, it started as simply as that. He, For one particular patient, he, he realized for the first time that that particular patient didn't have any records as far as a contract moving forward. <laughs> Right. And right. they're at the end of the treatment. Yeah. And okay. on, you know, a, a little bit further on with the story, um, he asked his office manager, you know, can you can you look at this? This patient doesn't have a contract. Why don't they have a contract? Where is their contract? Have they paid? Have they not paid? And she said, oh, yes, I specifically remember they paid in cash. And then she created this big story, which is totally unbelievable. Um, and that's what prompted him to call us because he found some indiscrepancies in what she was telling him. So the way that we work at Prosperident is we work with every single software in the dental industry. And we have a cloned copy of the software in our computer laboratory in Halifax. Once we engage with a client, we have the client make a duplicate copy of their data. They send that data to our computer laboratory and we plug it in to the copy of the software. So all the work we do is off-site from the office. No one in the office ever knows that there's an investigation happening. Um, we never meet the staff members. We never call the office. We handle everything through personal email and personal phone or mobile phone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we start going through the data and we start running analysis, um, different payment method analysis, deleted payment analysis, just tons and tons of, of different tests that we run. And we come back with a verdict, either yes, it's happening, we can confirm it, or no, it's not happening. And if we do confirm embezzlement, then we move further to help the client remove the employee from the office, um, help them avoid some legal minefields that may be down the road for them. We help them navigate so that they don't have unemployment issues to deal with um, or legal issues or things like that. So we help remove the employee and then um, we will help them to file a claim on their dishonesty insurance if they have that. Um, and then we give them guidelines on exactly how the person was stealing and what methods they need to use to clean up their accounts, basically. Right, right. Um, and you know what? If if embezzlement is not found, um, we simply write a report telling our clients exactly what type of testing that we've done. Um, and we can make recommendations to them about some possible holes that we see in their policies and procedures and the way that they're doing things in their office. Yeah, I know. It's so great because it, it didn't even occur to me uh, until I watched you speak in Scottsdale that there's so much, so, so many 
similarities to what we do because I'm looking for holes in in cash flow. You know, when I when I look at when I look at uh, raw data that people send in, we put it into our software and then we 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 come up with a scorecard. And um, it, it's very very common that the dentist doesn't know what their profitability is, um, what their overhead is, and where the holes are in their bucket. You know, so mm -hmm. I it, it's it's not surprising at all to me that a dentist would not be aware that they are being embezzled upon. In fact, your story about the first office that you worked for when the staff was like, where is all the money? Yeah. Um, I, we yeah. have, we have doctors come to us all the time saying, where is the money? And yeah. um, I'm looking for something totally different than you are. I'm looking at, you know, expenses that are over here, uh, you know, just way out of whack as far as staff, staff, uh, staff salaries or, you know, lab fees or, um, you know, dental supplies or whatever. And those things stand out to us glaringly, but you guys have your own formula where you're looking for different things where money is being siphoned out in a place here or there. So it's, 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 it has just occurred to me and it occurred to me at the summit that there's so much similar to what we do behind the scenes when we're analyzing numbers. It's pretty, pretty cool, isn't it? And you know, Dr. Costas, as I as I said earlier, um, it, it, that's why I admire you so much for bringing this subject to the forefront and shining a spotlight on it. A lot of times, we we focus on marketing, we focus on production, we focus on collection, we focus on um, how to treat our patients, how to create a team environment. But the simple fact is, is that you cannot have a successful practice if someone is cannibalizing your profit. So true. Mm -hmm. And that's that's where it basically ends up at. Um, so I, I think us working together and you having the courage to bring this to the forefront, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely love it. And I think it's a huge, huge service to your clients. Well, thank you. I really appreciate what you guys are doing for the industry as well. Can I get a little bit deeper into what you just mentioned uh, just briefly, and that's dishonesty insurance. Can you tell me a little bit about what dentists can do to protect themselves before they even go down the road of figuring out if they're being embezzled upon? Is that oh. one of the things they should make sure they have in place is some sort of insurance policy for that? Yeah, absolutely. Thank, okay. That's a good question. Thanks for asking. Sure. Um, there, most most people have a have an employee dishonesty policy or a, it's like a rider on your fire insurance. Um, most people have it and they don't even know that they have it um, and, and they're already paying for it. Um, but it comes in different um, it, it comes in different levels. you know um, generally it starts at 25, it'll go 20, 25, 50, 75, 100. And you can go on it from there. Um, generally, the clients that I work with, they'll have a, somewhere between 50 and 75. I think over 100 is, is a bit excessive unless, you know, you've got a multi, multi-million dollar practice. Um, but anyway, what the, dis, what the employee dishonesty insurance does is um, it allows the doctor the opportunity to recover some of the losses. Now, in the cases for my clients, all of the losses are never fully recovered, mm -hmm. um, but at least it helps. Mm -hmm. um, and in some cases, it will even cover like the, um, the prosperident fee for the investigation. It will cover that. Um, it will cover miscellaneous charges like having to um, change the locks in your practice or um, having to pay an employee overtime for going back and cleaning up um, cleaning up your accounts after someone has embezzled from you. And it covers different things like that. So have you found that your reports, uh, your definitive reports that that prove there has been embezzlement occurring, that's enough to just hand over to the insurance company and say, okay, we have a claim here for employee dishonesty and, they, and they're and they obligated to kind of pay that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. They're, they're, they're not obligated to pay it, but um, I, I do. Uh, I actually pride myself um, on my report, on my report writing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, because one of my uh, one of my business philosophies is to give back way more than you receive. And, um, it, you know, I, I, I really have a lot of compassion for my clients, um, both from a business standpoint and emotionally, because I understand I've been through that before when your very best employee is stealing from you. Ugh. And it's heartbreaking yeah. and it's gut-wrenching and I feel the same for them. So I try and, and uh, do my very best to, to do everything for them so they don't have to worry about it. Um, and generally, um, once I write the report and I know exactly, I've done it so many times, I know exactly what the insurance company is looking for. Right, okay. Um, and sometimes they'll even pay out in three days. Wow. Okay. I was even impressed with that one with a minimum of, minimal amount of questions, um, they just read the report and say, yeah, we agree with you. Okay. So I'm going to expand on that question just a little bit. So we, we, we were just talking about insurance. Now, when you are done with your report and you have your um, proof that there has been embezzlement happening, so what happens next? There is something that involves the authorities now, or do you approach that uh, the offending employee and say, hey, we know you've been stealing? How, how does that all go down? I, I'm just trying to picture how that goes down in an office. Um, well, generally, by the time we get to the part where the insurance comes in, the employee is already out of the office. Okay. Um, and there is a very, very specific method that you have to follow to um, legally protect yourself from minefields in the future. Okay. But um, going back to the insurance company, most insurance companies will require the doctor to file a police report. Uh, okay. That basically means nothing, unfortunately, Dr. Costas. <laughs> um, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that, that anything is going to happen to the suspect, but you do have to go down and you do have to make a report of it. Mm. Now, what will happen is if the insurance company or when the insurance company pays out, they will subjugate for you. And so they will go to the suspect themselves and they will say, Okay, you stole money from Dr. Smith, and we paid back Dr. Smith, and now you owe us money. So they use their attorneys to go after the suspect. Okay. And that really works out for the doctor because, um, you know, it's, it's such a touchy situation, and a lot of times um, doctors are concerned about their reputation in the community. Um. You know, unfortunately, this week I've worked with a doctor helping to release an employee that's been with him for 25 years. And besides the emotional trauma that has happened to him, finding out she's been stealing from him and having to release her from service, he's also got to tackle, what's she going to say about me? When right. she gets out into the community, she's going to go out and she's going to tell everybody what a horrible person I am. When on the other hand, the doctor cannot do the same. I mean, the doctor cannot go out into the community and say, hey, this person stole from me. That's why I released her from service. It's not that I'm a bad person. She was stealing from me. Um, you cannot do that unless legal charges are filed. Right. Um, but another thing that he was incredibly concerned about as well was his referral sources. So now... He's got to draft a letter and take it to his referral sources and the other dentist in the small town where he's at um, so that he can he can explain to them exactly what happened to him so that they understand so that his business doesn't dwindle because people think he's a horrible person because he fired this employee. So he's a specialist as well, this particular um uh, doctor you were working with this week. I'm sorry? He's a specialist as well, the one that you were working with this week, a, a dental specialist? Yes, yes, okay. he is. This episode is being brought to you by the 5th Annual Dental Success Summit. This live dental event is unlike any other dental conference or CE event in existence today. At this year's event, each and every attendee will leave with the exact implementable plan, a roadmap, if you will, to creating a systems-driven dental practice. Practices that are organized, efficient, well-regarded in the community, wildly profitable, and immune to competition exist. And they're all systems-dependent practices. And we can help yours get there too. 17 CE units 
incredible food and cocktails, some of the best speakers in our profession, all taking place on the water in beautiful San Diego, California, one of my favorite cities in the world. What more could you ask for? So grab your advanced early bird ticket for the fifth annual Dental Success Summit 2017, taking place March 31st through April 1st. Right now, the tickets are 70% off their normal price for an extremely limited time. This event has completely sold out for the last four years, so don't miss your opportunity to grab your seat today. Go to dentalsuccesssummit.com slash podcast to register today. That's dentalsuccesssummit.com slash podcast for 70% off our normal price. We look forward to meeting you live in San Diego. So here you go and enjoy the episode. All right, so we identify somebody stealing from us. Um, the good news is they can't steal from us anymore because we're going to get rid of them. What are what's the recourse? What is there any chance that besides insurance, where we can recover any of that money that they stole? And then um, that's part one of my question. And part two of my question is how many? What percentage of people that you actually find out are embezzling go to jail? Ooh, wow, that is a really really <laughs> touchy question. <laughs> Uh, okay. As, as far as recovery is concerned, okay. let's say, um, a client has an insurance policy that covers 50,000 okay. and mm -hmm. we've uncovered that a hundred thousand has been stolen. Mm -hmm. Um, so the insurance policy pays 50, but the doctor is still out of pocket 50,000 Sure. Mm -hmm. to recover that additional money over and above what your insurance pays you have to take that person to court. You have to file legal charges against them. Okay. Um, and so it, it's a very, very long process. Um, it's sometimes it will have to go before a grand jury, and the grand jury will decide, yes, we have probable cause to bring charges against this person, or no, we don't. Um, and then it goes through the court system, and then a judgment is awarded to the doctor for payment or repayment of $100,000. Okay. okay. The insurance company gets their money first. They get the first 50000 no matter what because they've made you whole for that 50000 oh. um, And so after the insurance company gets their fifty, then the doctor would get their fifty. I see. Okay. Um, but to answer your second question, um, it's it's really something that I struggle with internally because I completely understand. Out of three years, out of all of the clients that I've helped, which have been hundreds, I've had one that has pressed legal charges. And the employee left their office in 2010. She was arrested in 2013 and they still have not gone to trial. Wow. That's how long of a process it takes. And my struggle comes from, I totally understand why a doctor would not want to pursue legal charges. Mm -hmm. um, because of the time, um, because of the expense of getting the records together, um, the expense in court, I understand all of that. But on the other hand, I also realize that what allows a serial embezzler to go from one office to the next, to the next, to the next, is because we do not file legal charges against them. And when if someone has embezzled from you, even if a prospective employer calls your office for a reference, you cannot tell them that that person has stolen from you. I, I find that totally outrageous uh, because if you do, then the suspect could sue you for slander. So you have to press charges in order to be able to say that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Oh, okay. So, you know, our recommendations to our clients who who choose not to press charges, and again, I understand why, 
But our recommendation is when you get um, a call for a reference from someone who has embezzled from you, immediately, immediately you say, I will only answer two questions. Yes, that person worked here from X date to X date and absolutely not. I would never have that person back in my office. And that's all you say. Yeah, you don't, you're, you're not slandering that person in any way. Hopefully the person on the other end of the line will get there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So I've had seven practices. We're, we're building, I'm sorry, I've had six practices. We're building our seventh right now, hoping to have three more in the next year and a half. I think back to the, the people that have worked front desk for me over the years, and I have fond memories of some of them, and I have not so fond memories of some of them, um, but none of them did I think that were stealing from me. And before, you know, I realized how important it was to track your numbers and, and watch your overhead and your expenses very, very carefully. I probably have been victim, and according to your um, your statistics, I, there's there's a very high likelihood that in that amount of time, I, I've uh, I've been victim to some level of embezzlement. So, why don't you help us to to determine or help us to kind of um, paint a picture of what we're looking for, the types of behaviors that we're looking for in our employees to 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 send off some red flags so we can make sure that we're we're you know aware when this is. Uh, beginning to become a problem in our offices? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, ironically, an embezzler looks exactly like your very best employee. The one who always stays late, the one who comes in early, the one who never takes vacation because they're so dedicated, um, the one who uh, works on Saturdays, works on Sundays, the difference to me, the way that you the way that you tell an embezzler from your very best employee is transparency. If you if you have an accounting question and you go to your very best, most dedicated employee who appears to be somewhat of a workaholic, mm -hmm. if you go to them and you ask them, can you can you explain this transaction to me? They'll do it right off the top of their head. They'll know exactly why they did it. If they can't tell you right off the top of their head, they'll tell you where to go to find the answer or they'll go find the answer for you. They'll say, oh, Dr. Costas, I, uh, there's a note about that on the ledger. Um, I went in the computer system and I made a note under the comment section or in the notes section and this is exactly why I did it. And, and they'll give you every detail of it. If you go to an embezzler and you ask them the same question, they won't be able to give you an answer. Hmm. They'll say, gee, you know, I, I don't remember Dr. Costas. I, I, I really got to think about that. And you say, okay, can you, um, can you let me know by the end of the day? Well, the end of the day rolls around and they just never bring it up again. Mm -hmm. It's just gone because they can't answer the question for you because they don't have a legitimate reason. Um, or there, you know, I, I had one particular case where um, the doctor's wife was very involved, and she's she's actually the one who uh, who brought Prosperity into the picture for the doctor because they didn't have any money, hmm. and she kept saying, "Where's the money? You're so busy. Where's the money?" And so she asked she asked her husband. She said, "I'd like for you to bring home an AR report for me because something's not right." And he brings home a post-it note <laughs> that post has note. three people's names on it. And the wife looks at it and she says, what is this? And he said, well, that, that's the AR report. And she said, no, it's not. It's usually a couple of pages long. It comes out of the computer. It's got, you know, lots of everybody's name on it and the 30, 60, 90. Where is that report? And the doctor said, well, I don't know. This, this, this is all she gave me. So what she had done is, you know, obviously she didn't want him to see that report. So she was trying to hide it mm -hmm. from him. So embezzlers have to be alone to do what they do. 
Obviously, because if they're not, someone can see what they're doing and they'll be caught. Um, also, an employee that tends to have a lifestyle that is beyond their means. You know, for example, um, one of my clients, um, her or uh, one of my clients that has been embezzled from the staff member and her husband have a combined income of about eighty thousand dollars a year. Well, they have a houseboat, they have a Hummer, they're always taking vacations. And now I'm not. I don't advocate or, or I'm not suggesting that we should judge other people's lifestyles. But there is an internal sense that we know because and we do we do work closely together with our staff members. You know, did this person receive an inheritance by chance? Um, you know, is maybe that where their money's coming from? You know, or or, or where where are they getting this money from? Mm -hmm. That's the first one. The second thing is are they in extreme, it's kind of one extreme or the other. Either they're living beyond their means or they're in desperate financial trouble. Mm -hmm. Like they're about to foreclose on their home um, or husband is in jail or son is in jail or daughter's in jail. Um, you look for those types of extremes and Unfortunately, addiction is a huge, huge factor in embezzlement. So, um, you know, drug addiction, um, alcoholism, um, different addictions such as that um, generally end up cre creating a need for extra money. And so, you know, to feed their addiction, they steal from the doctor. Sure. Yeah. Is that how? <laughs> That helps a lot. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you're looking for somebody that stays late, um, refuses to, to, um, to take vacation and somebody that really, um, is really guarded about her workspace, right? Uh, somebody Absolutely. that, somebody, Absolutely. somebody that you, you ask a, a question and they either get really defensive or they just kind of blow you off. Absolutely. Okay. Refuses to be cross-trained. Um, refuses to take vacation and that's incredibly important and I know whenever I say that you know whenever I'm lecturing and I say that to a crowd I can just hear the gasps oh my gosh you want me to force my employee to take a vacation no I can't do that no I can't stand to be without my employees I'm glad they don't take vacation but here's why that's so important whatever scheme they're doing they have to be right there to continue it. Let's say there's a check substitution scheme. They have to be there because they have to continue it. They have to be there to answer the phone when a patient calls and says, hey, I got my statement and this is definitely not right. They have to be there to field those questions and answer them for the patient and to keep them, keep those questions away from other people in the office so that they can make it right. Mm -hmm. So if they, you know, if they don't take a vacation, well, certainly maybe do a little bit of cross training for a week. Have have your receptionist work in the clinic for a week and have a clinical assistant work up front. I mean, everybody loves cross training. It's it's detrimental to a practice that our employers are cross trained. So there is another reason to cross train your employees. Do you find that it it more often happens when one person is in charge of the books or the billing versus a team of people, or do, have you seen it both ways? It, it, you know, it it goes both ways. Um, I would love to be able to say, you know, shared duties, um, employees shared responsibilities and duties is the way that you stop embezzlement from happening, but it's just not true. Um, it happens no matter if one person is in charge of everything or if you've got 10 people posting payments and making adjustments. Right. Are, are, are these people usually pretty seasoned? Are, are they, first of all, I, I to me, um, I get 
kind of blurry eyed when I start looking at my own reports. And that's why, <laughs> that's why I have really good bookkeepers. I have, you know, I have a financial guy that crunches all of our clients numbers and puts them into digestible reports that I can read before I start looking at line item by line item and categorizing things. And um, so are, are these, would you consider these people fairly intelligent people that are able to pull this off or just desperate or greedy or, or what, what are, what, what's driving them other than, other than, you know, the ability to do it because they have access to this cash. All three. Okay. All three. They're, they're very intelligent. Mm -hmm. Um, the average, uh, tenure is about five years. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Um, so it's someone who's familiar with your systems. They're familiar with what you look at mm. and what you don't look at. So, for example, um, a lot of doctors are very focused on collections. Right. I want to see a weekly collections report. I want to see a weekly collections report, but they don't ever look at adjustments unless there's a problem with the collections. Then they say, oh, let's go look at the adjustments. If I know you don't look at the adjustments, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to make adjustments. Um, so they know what you look at. They know what you don't look at. Um, they've, they've been in the practice generally for five or more years. Um, I went back and did kind of an unofficial study on my own clients, and the average hourly wage is $21 an hour. Hmm. which is which is pretty outstanding um one of them i mean she even made 27 dollars an hour wow okay. and absolutely stole the doctor blind um so they're they're very very intelligent and do you um, find do, do you find these people kind of rationalize in their head even though they're making 27 bucks an hour are they thinking well this guy owes it to me because i never take vacation and i've been with him for for 20 years and and by the way, he, he makes, you know, X number of dollars anyway, that jerk. And, and I work harder than he does. And do you, do you feel yeah. that they kind of rationalize their behavior in their own head? Absolutely. Absolutely. They do. Um, actually we base our theories off of what, um, is known as the fraud triangle. Okay. And it starts first, um, with either intent, which is driven out of need or greed. Okay. And the second step is rationalization, which is exactly what you're talking about. Well, the doctor just got a new car. The doctor just got a new Lexus. Well, I want a new Lexus. <laughs> you know, I'm here longer every day than he is or she is. I, I, I you know, I, 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 I have more interaction with the patients than even really the doctor does. So I deserve this. Right. That's the rationalization. And all the doctor does is is provide an avenue to the opportunity. That's why I would really love for us to get away from having the conversation that this is the doctor's fault because it's absolutely not. Take for example, you have all things being equal, you have the same doctor, you have the same computer system, you have the same policies and procedures in an office. You have two employees one chooses to steal and the other one doesn't. Right. Why? Because they've gone through this incentive and rationalization process. One of them has where the other one hasn't. Right. Right. So, okay. I'm thoroughly depressed now. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, don't be depressed. I'm sorry. It's okay. You're making me really sad about humanity in general. But I mean, it's just the reality of the situation. Um, can you give us, as a group of dentists that are listening to this podcast, some tips, some advice of of what we can do to protect ourselves, and then we'll kind of wrap it up by by letting you tell us how we can get in touch with Prosperident and 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 move forward with you guys. Okay, fantastic. Um, what you can do to protect yourself, number one, um, it, we believe that the number one way that you can um, look for embezzlement is to research the behavior of your staff members, as you mentioned. Prosperident does have um, 
it's a it's a form that has 33 different questions regarding employee behavior and it's called the embezzlement risk assessment questionnaire um, and you can you can call Prosperident or email us and request a copy of that that assesses the behavior um, a second thing that I always tell that I always tell my clients and and when I lecture is that we, we need to get rid of the idea that we can prevent somebody from stealing from us because we can't. Mm -hmm. What we can do is we can detect it early. Okay. The only difference between a $10,000 theft and a $100,000 theft is when it's caught. So if you catch it early enough, you can contain it. And some of the tools that I suggest um, reviewing is um, deleted payments, number one. Um, and then also to do um, a, a payment method analysis focusing on cash for, it's like a trend analysis for five years. And you'll see cash, it'll vary generally one to 2% per year. But if you see like a straight down roller coaster arrow, then you know something is going on. As far as the percentage of cash that's coming in? Right, okay. exactly. It's okay. the percentage of cash that's coming in, the percentage of cash versus collections, total okay. collections. So I'm actually writing all this stuff down right now. This is crazy. Okay. Stuff. Percentage <laughs> of cash versus collections. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. And then another thing um, that I like to, to let people know is it's important when you're when you're doing your reconciliation maybe not you or your bookkeeper or your accountant or whoever's doing it <clears throat> the reconciliation needs to be done between your computer software and between your merchant statements and your bank statements a lot of people will only reconcile their merchant statements and their bank statements to their accounting software like quickbooks or quicken or and they reconcile there. The thing with an embezzler is that I show you what I want you to see, right? If I'm stealing money from you, wouldn't I be totally silly to put it on a deposit slip? Right. You know? So, of course, you're not going to see that. I'm going to show you what I want you to see. So, when you go to your computer system, then you're saying what's actually there and if uh, perhaps an extra day sheet was run on a couple of days and you never saw that day sheet it just disappeared you would never know that because i never gave you the day sheet because i didn't want you to see it because i stole the money oh that's so uh, good that reconciliation piece is so key i think getting the software to match the accounting software to match the bank statements yes uh, that's huge and so few dentists that i come across actually do that um, and some of the ones that have really, really successful offices tell me that they've never been able to reconcile those three things. Um, and I'm not saying that they're getting embezzled, but that just means that they need to tighten up their systems that much more. You know, there's no reason why we can't re reconcile those three things. Um, and, it, and it's so important for checks and balances purposes. And that, that's a yeah. huge point, Wendy. I appreciate that. Okay. So then, I mean, other than that, um, you can get a hold of me um, at Wendy, W-E-N-D-Y, at dentalembezzlement.com. Okay. And then how? what's the resource for the embezzlement assessment questionnaire again? Um, you know what? They can send me an email. Okay. And I will, I will forward that to them. Or you can call Prosperident directly. Okay. Do you happen to have that telephone number handy? Prosperident's telephone number? I do. Um, that number is 902-422-0592. Awesome. And that, that goes directly to Prosperident. You can also visit um, fraud at prosperident.com. Or you can visit our website at www.prosperident.com. And I do know that if you visit your website, because I've done this before I even met you guys, um, if you go to prosperident.com, you can sign up for their newsletter and then they, they send yes. you. Oh, thank you so much. 
much for mentioning that. Oh, sure. I mean, I was a I, I was a follower before I even met you or David. So um, that's how I actually how you guys came on my radar. Um, oh. So yeah, you have great um, newsletters that come out monthly. Yeah, yeah. David Harris does an uh, he's responsible for that. He does a wonderful job of the content that he sends out each month. Right. So that that's a really nice resource to have. Okay, I'm going to wrap up with one one question that um, because I think we've covered a ton of information. I really thank you for being here today. But what's the biggest embezzlement um, number that you've seen in in your experience, or that you've heard your your company handle? Um, my personal largest was three hundred thousand in one year. Oh gosh. Well, wow, that's life, cha- um, life changing money for a doctor. <laughs> my uh, my colleague Bill Hiltz, um, he's the chief op- chief operating officer at Prosperident. Um, he's actually done a million. Wow is that is that over? I hope that's over a period of time and not one year. Yeah, that's that's over a period of time. It's not within one year, but okay. it's. I think that was like over a three to five year period. How much were you able to recapture of uh, for your client of the three hundred thousand? You sure you want to know the answer to that? Oh, is it going to make me even more <laughs> depressed? I'm so depressed right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, let, um, let me know. They had insurance for twenty five thousand. Oh, that's it, right? That's it. So they got to keep it from happening in the future, but that two hundred seventy five grand is just gone, flush. Yeah, it's gone. Uh, what about just, Bill? What about Bill's client, the million dollar client? Um, you know, I don't know. Okay. I'm sorry. You, you probably can't speak for Bill, but I, I, just, <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, you know, we, we share things like that with each other, but as far as the actual details of his case, I, I don't know. Okay. Wow. We, we actually have a million dollar club at Cross Paradise. Oh, that's so sad. I, that's $1 million club. I do not want to be a part of. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> but I guess, I guess the take home message here, Wendy, is that you know what? It, if it's happening, you have to identify it. Don't bury your head in the sand. And and if the fact that that particular client only got twenty five thousand back out of three hundred thousand, at least they stopped the bleeding. They identified it, and the practice can be healthy going forward. That's exactly right. And I guess, I guess a bit another big theme is that look, identify it, fix it, and moving forward, you don't have to worry about that again because you you now now have systems in place. And, um, oh, the funny thing is I was chatting with David one time. I'm sorry. I keep on changing, um, changing directions here, but David said that he's had several clients that were multiple customers of your, of your (laughs) company, right? Yeah. I've got one of those. This is a a second go around. Oh my goodness. It's like, didn't you learn anything from the first time around? I guess, I guess they're just kind of, they're magnets to those types of people, I guess. sometimes, Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Um, you know, I, I have to say, unfortunately, the second time around, um, uh, we had that conversation. Mm-hmm. You know, I said, I, 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 I gave you five pages of recommendations. D- did you, did, did you implement any of them? Well, no, I never had time. Oh, well, God. okay, here we are again. But you know, you, you, you've made the comment, oh, now I'm depressed. Now I'm, now I'm scared and, you know, there's there's no reason to be. I, I know this is a it's a very touchy subject that is pretty depressing. Yeah. But mm-hmm. I think the good news is is that we bring it to light, and it, it, it's exactly what you said. Now we know we know what to look for, and let's not ignore it anymore. Let's not say, "Oh, that can't happen to me." Right. Let's say, you know what? There's an 80% chance that it can happen to me and I'm going to stop it if it does. And I'm going to put systems in place where I can recognize it if it's happening. Right. So you're exactly mm-hmm. right. That's good news. Let's recognize it. Let's stop it from happening and keep our practices whole and protected from mischievous people that would cause us harm. Right. So the takeaway message is if you feel that something may be going on, there's a very, very good chance that something is going on in your practice as far as embezzlement. So 
Wendy um, and her team at Prosperident, it's that, that's that's definitely the leader in the industry, and that's who I would reach out to. So Wendy at dentalembezzlement.com, fraud at prosperident.com. There was such great information that you shared with us today, Wendy, and I really appreciate your time. And I hope that we can have you back out to speak at another one of our events sometime soon. Oh, you bet. You bet. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I love meeting with your group. It, it, your, your group is just amazing. I appreciate it. And they loved you too. <laughs> oh, thanks. Okay. So we're going to sign off for now. Um, thank you for uh, visiting with us for another episode of the Dentalpreneur Podcast. We'll speak to you next week. Thanks again, Wendy. Thanks. Bye-bye. Today's episode is being brought to you by JetLab, home of the $77 Zirconia Crown. If you're looking for an exceptional dental lab that's both affordable and reliable, visit JetLabServices.com. That's J-E-T LabServices.com and order a starter kit. This is the lab that I personally use for all of my crown and bridge, and I couldn't be happier with their consistency and awesome customer service. And that wraps it up for another episode of the Dentalpreneur Podcast. I thank you so much for joining us this week, and we will talk to you next week. Take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Dentalpreneur Podcast. Check out TrueDentalSuccess.com for full recaps of every show, a schedule of our live events, free video tutorials, and a whole host of practice-building resources.